All right, welcome back, you guys, from lunch. Glad to see you here. Um, I get to introduce a couple of speakers from MITRE Corporation. Right. So this is Gavin Black and Greg Ganley, and they focus on doing research and development for iOS and other uh, mobile security stuff. So sounds like they have a very interesting talk for us on iOS app, integri app integrity got any. So here's Gavin and Greg. Thank you very much. All right, great. Um, once again, my name is Greg Ganley, and this is Gavin Black, and we're uh, we, we're out from Boston, uh, Mass, the Boston Mass area. Uh, we're here to we're uh, we work for the MITRE Corporation. We're mobile security researchers on a project called IMAS. So, a quick background on what IMAS is. Um, essentially, IMAS is an iOS application defense. Is uh, if the if, if we had a short elevator elevator ride, that's what I tell you. If the elevator ride was a little bit longer, it's uh, we're we basically we're researching uh, iOS security uh, and we're providing an open source framework uh, to really reduce vulnerability information loss. That's that's kind of the takeaway. And um, this research is actually spo it's paid for internally by MITRE. Uh, MITRE has an internal research program and folks uh, kind of bid for this. And this is our third year getting funding. Uh, uh, for this project. So uh, our open source um, uh, activities has really helped uh, keep this funded. So uh, uh, the research we're doing is each year we're kind of getting deeper and deeper into um, iOS security. And so that's what we'll, we'll talk to you a little bit about. So just to give a quick background on hacking and jailbreaking iOS. You know, attacks and weaknesses are well documented. Um, you know, if you go out uh, up on Amazon, there's several books available. You Google around, you'll find uh, these free uh, PDFs to download. Um, there's the latest jailbreak by Pangu. So if you had, you know, iOS 7.1 to 7.1x, uh, one can easily jailbreak these devices and, you know, that's the whole notion of patching it and getting root access and disabling key um, security. Once uh, one has a device that's been jailbroken, um, you can easily install a brute force application. And this was a slide that uh, Dino Dasovi put up a few years ago at Black Hat. It just talks about the times for cracking these passwords. Now recall in iOS, they actually keep the uh, portions of the uh, passcode um, or the key to unlock things inside the device itself. Um, and so you can't just grab the key bag and put it up to Amazon and, 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 uh, and try to run a bunch of parallel processes, you have to use the device. So anyways, um, short passcodes are, are relatively easy to crack. And once you have that passcode, that essentially is the key to unlock um, everything, uh, a lot, a lot, many of the security features that Apple provides. Um, so just, we put together this slide back in March, and it just talks about kind of the, 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 the recent uh, security issues back in March, uh, but the point is is that there's just a flow of vulnerabilities that are being exposed and that Apple is patching. Um, if we were to spend, you know, a day or so, um, you know, just last week putting together, uh, we could easily have found more that happened over the summer. The point is is that um, there is, you know, zero days, there's latent vulnerabilities and just bugs built into iOS and folks find them, and so security is still important. Um, this particular uh, uh, disclosure by um, John Jartsky just just last month, uh, a few months ago, July 18th. He was at the Hope X conference, and um, he disclosed that you know iOS 7 and iOS 8 beta um, had uh, you know kind of a serious vulnerability where essentially um, uh, it's a di some diagnostic software that was um, a Apple provides that you, one could go in and extract large portions of the disk and, and extract sensitive data. There's actually a network sniffer that's running on um, iOS devices as well. Um, Apple responded to him and said uh, that these are, um, you know, diagnostic based uh, facilities. We're keeping them. Um, but just last night, um, iOS 8 came out, and along with that, in the Washington Post, um, Apple will no longer unlock most iPhones or iPads for police, even with search warrants. And the thought was is that that diagnostic tools were tied to, um, were, were basically the means by which they accessed uh, this th this information. So in iOS 8, uh, they've actually closed down some some significant that th those particular backdoors uh, pretty significantly. At least that's what they said. So, um, so to just kind of wrap it up, um, if you look at iOS today, a standard, a standard native app has several vulnerabilities around it. It's the four-digit passcode, RAM and debugger, um, jailbreak root access, user authorization, access to the disk itself. Um, so all these areas are, are, are you know, are vulnerable. Are, are vulnerable. Um, so introducing IMAS. So 
our research idea is a secure application framework where we, we target the native iOS app. We surround it with essentially software libraries, uh, security controls that serve to uh, take controls or security beyond what uh, Apple provides uh, to really reduce that iOS attack surface. And these are vetted controls. We've uh, had them third party vetted outside of MITRE to make sure that we're doing the right things. Um, and then we've, uh, we've created an open source community. Uh, it's up on GitHub today. And, um, so just to give you a sense, you know, where we sit in the iOS stack, um, if you look, all the um, boxes in gray, generally most things in gray are uh, owned by Apple and they're closed. Uh, it's unlike Android where most is open source. And so with, with the research area for Apple is really at the application level. And that's where uh, iMass sits up at the app sandbox, essentially really surrounding that native iOS app. So if we take a look at the app security trade space, um, you know, it's my claim that the more security controls you add to an application, um, the more, um, the, the kind of higher the sensitive information level you can, you can bring onto the device. And so, you know, looking at iOS version 6 and version 7, um, you know, they obviously have security controls in them and as, they, and as they've come out, they've, they've added more and more security controls. If you add a mobile device management system or perhaps a, uh, an app container, there's even more controls added. Well, IMAS goes beyond what's out there today um, and as a result, we, we claim that we can operate in more, uh, in, you know, bring information that's more sensitive uh, to the point that perhaps, you know, HIPAA information and things like that can be brought in, and, and uh, used with inside of an IMAS uh, bolstered application. We haven't uh, looked deeply at iOS 8 uh, particularly. That's coming up in the next couple of months. Uh, as you know, if you try to follow the betas, the betas change a lot. Um, uh, you know, just last night they disclosed that they're, you know, they, they're shutting down, a, they closed a major security gap. So uh, we, we typically wait till the iOS 8 is out or the next version is out and then we'll start researching it. So our security controls uh, that we have out today, um, real quick, if this is kind of contrasts the vulnerability to what controls we have, and I'm not going to talk about every ticket, all, all of them on here, but the idea is that all the ones in green are the particular controls. An example would be passcode check. You know, um, the thought is is that um, Apple today does not provide an, uh, an interface or an API that says uh, that. that that, that tells the developer, you know, has the user set their passcode, and if so, is it a complex passcode? Um, you just can't get that question answered, so passcode check is, is a solution to help the developer programmatically answer that. Um, we, we, we also have uh, uh, a control called app password, which just basically allows the developer to put a passcode in front of an app um, specific to that app. And it's, uh, if you go on to GitHub and you, you look around, there's several that are out there. This particular one is uh, securing, uh, is securing the keys properly and all that kind of stuff. So um, uh, it's just a little more uh, deeply vetted. Um, the, the other control that um, we'll talk about is encrypted core data. That's one where we've taken the database SQLite and we've added security controls to it. And then just jumping over on the app tampering side, we have forced inlining where um, we have the notion where you can, um, you can, you can, we've played with the compiler enough that we have a, a set of instructions that allow you to um, actually force the compiler to copy code. So compilers are always trying to optimize code and reduce the copies. With security, we want to copy code and make it difficult and, uh, so that patches, uh, hackers have to patch many more places. So that's what forced inlining does. So let me just keep going here. Um, in the interest of time. So if you look at our controls, uh, mo most of them you can wrap with your app and deploy on the Apple App Store. Um, but a few are specific to the enterprise app store only, and that's just because the particular techniques we're using, um, and that's really what we're targeting. Um, part of it is we 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 want to basically f facilitate enterprises to deploy uh, custom applications in a secure way, and um, so we have uh, like up on GitHub we have 13 controls. Um, we have them all listed here, and um, you can see there's a whole a whole host of folks that have uh, developers that have starred them and forked them. Um, we have about 470 some odd developers over the last 18 months that have that have starred uh, that have shown interest by starring these, and uh, I think we have about 100 or so that have forked forked uh, the code. Uh, so that means that you know actively making copies of it, and, um, and and you know some of them, a lot of them are contributing back. If you look at the um, the IMAS use scenarios. Um, you know, when we started off, we focused on the native app and the idea that, hey, you're an enterprise, you're building an enterprise app, uh, native app, you need more security, 
you know, download our source code and uh, make use of it. But we've also, along the way, um, we've come up with the other scenarios where the scenario where uh, an enterprise is just using the iOS device for email and calendaring and um, with no apps at all. Um, so what we, we have an app called, uh, I should say, a security control called Sentry App where it allows, uh, this works with an MDM solution, essentially has our, some of our key IMAS controls in it that can download and place that on, uh, on, on a enterprise device. The next one is the thin client app. That's the kind of the next stage that enterprises usually go through. The notion where um, they have email and calendaring and then, then the um, users say, well, geez, I want to be able to do uh, a small web, uh, a web app that I can reach back in and do my time card or something. Um, we have controls for that as well. And then finally, the thick client, that's the native app. That's where the lion's share of uh, our controls are, are useful. So at this time, I'm going to hand it off to Gavin, and he's going to talk more, uh, do a deep dive about our technical, technically get into and show you more about our controls. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Greg. Um, so just kind of also to reiterate that a lot of this is, it's open source. I mean, we're identifying the vulnerabilities and then proposing more or less patches to them and then putting out like demos of how to patch it. Um, kind of the... The idea is to get kind of the community involved and to kind of take these over. So again, we're not really pitching a particular solution, but we're just saying there are solutions. Uh, maybe you should go think about them, especially if you're developing iOS apps. Um, and with that said, kind of one of our more popular controls has been this encrypted core data. Um, if any of you have actually worked with uh, building iOS applications, you're probably familiar with core data. Uh, Apple pushes you very strongly if you want to do persistence. Um, I keep data between runs of an application. Um, they push you to use this core data, and it's more or less an object model, and it lets you draw the entity relationships. It's, it's a nice little framework, um, but under the hood, all they're actually doing is shoving everything in a SQLite database. Um, and this SQLite database lives in your application sandbox. And so an attacker who, who uh, has access to an unlocked phone or somehow gets past the trust chain, there, there's lots of tricks for getting into an app sandbox. Um, if they get into your application sandbox, well, the data is just sitting there in plain text. If you run Unix strings on it, it just pops right out. Um, here we have a, a little uh, hackneyed example, but there's, there's real examples on the web if you visit the page of, of sensitive patient information that you might not want leaking out at the time we're working on a healthcare app. Um, so yeah, there you can see that data is just there in the plain text. Anyone can get to it as long as they can get to the sandbox. And so what we've actually done is take the SQL Cipher um, open source project, another very popular project um, with a nice BSD license, and basically it shims on top of SQLite and encrypts data to and from disk. So now only your memory is vulnerable, and there's no way to actually get at the data in the database without the memory. Um, and you can see down there, it ends up just being like random garbage if someone were to dump the sandbox. And the other really nice thing about encrypted core data and why I think it's, it's really kind of taken off, we have a lot, actually probably more external people from MITRE um, actually contributing in than internal at this point. Um, so it shows that there's kind of a need for it. And what we've actually done is use NS incremental store if anyone's actually played with that. Um, Long story short, um, whenever you set up core data, there's a persistent store coordinator. You can swap it out with whatever you want. Um, we've pretty much had to re-implement our own from scratch, um, but the nice thing is at the end of the day, you replace uh, half a line um, of the boilerplate that Apple generates, and now everything's encrypted. You don't even have to think about it. And again, we're just kind of, again, we're talking kind of about the building blocks of making something secure. And with that said, a lot of these controls kind of play together, depending on how paranoid you are, um, which you should be if you're worried about security. Um, so down there we have encrypted core data, but encrypted core data, you obviously have to have a password when you're talking encryption. You, you have to have some sort of nonce that has to be protected. Um, and with that said, we have the app password. So again, this is just like a password unlock screen, very com fully configurable. Um, but it's for an individual application and not the device. So if you have a sensitive app, and we actually have customers uh, doing like banking who care about their app much more than they care about the full device, uh, you put the app password on there. Uh, we provide a version of, of the Apple keychain, which again, the Apple keychain is vulnerable if the device is unlocked or the trust chain is broken. Um, you put an app password. It decrypts um, the keychain, which acts just like Apple's, except for encrypted. Um, at which point, if you're really paranoid, you can actually start protecting regions of memory, which I'll talk about a little more, more later. Um, again, just to further 
uh, reduce that attack vulnerability. So what we've done on like healthcare projects is put it in memory um, and wipe it pretty much whenever we're not using the SQL cipher key um, under the hood that's just a C struct. And then that all filters back into core data. But again, I mean, this can be just as simple as hooking a passcode right to core data, but you can get it as fancy as you want. So another cool piece of research I thought was interesting was we've been working with uh, UC Irvine. They have more or less, they've been changing the LLVM and Clang um, to more or less support multi-compiler. And what that means is, I'm, I'm sure you're aware when you compile a program, um, at some point there's assembly and it gets put out into raw binary. Um, we'll just focus kind of on the assembly. Um, whenever you compile a program, if the code has not changed, the assembly doesn't change and the underlying binary doesn't change. And so if attacker has that binary, they can do uh, static attacks. They can pull it up in Ida Pro or Hopper um, and start patching it, put no op sleds over your checks, all sorts of nastiness. Um, so kind of with that said, what can you do? Well, if you're an enterprise, uh, maybe you'd want each app to actually have a different binary. And that's what their research focuses on. How, when you compile, can you have it make a completely different binary? So now an attacker has to patch each individual instance. Um, so we see over there some of their tricks are put no ops um, just kind of randomly throughout the, the assembly instructions. So that changes where the instructions actually are in memory. So now an attacker, I, I mean, there is ASLR already on the iOS device. Um, but this goes a little bit further and a little finer granularity. Um, and also, kind of hand waving over this, but they have, they changed the instruction scheduler and that's kind of like affecting how the optimization works. And what's cool about that is you end up with different registers and you end up with different instruction order. So now that's very, very hard for an attacker to say, okay, I've patched this one app, this patch will not apply to another one. Um, and so what we've actually done with IMAS is, so they had done this for LLVM and Clang, um, but as far as we know, we're the only ones who have actually tested this for iOS apps. And we've built CocoaPods, if you're familiar with those, and scripts, if you don't want to use those, uh, that will modify your Xcode project to work with their multi-compiler, um, because it is a full version of Clang that has to be compiled. Um, and kind of, again, the golden source of the, or the, the the, the best we could hope for is that this actually happens um, for each individual app, and that's kind of what they're working at. Each individual deploy changes at runtime. So that's kind of what they're working towards, but that's kind of on the horizon. So right now, you can just change it each time it compiles. So as Greg kind of mentioned earlier, every iOS application is its own sandbox. You can't see other applications, and there's no equivalent of proc on iOS, even if you jailbreak it. Um, so basically, you're stuck, you're stuck in your own little world and there's no way to see outside of it. But that's of course not true, um, as we see with all the attacks. And actually what we've done is, um, if you're familiar with syscontrol, it's a standard BSD Linux um, command that will actually ping the kernel, set, let you set kernel parameters, or actually get data back. Um, the getting data back actually works pretty well on a lot of iOS stuff. So we actually had to remake syscontrol in, in raw assembly um, and compile the .s for each individual architecture. Um, but at the end of the day, we get the ability to look at individual processes, all processes actually running on the device. So if you're running Dropbox, your app can see that Dropbox is running, it's been running as this user, it started at this time, and this is its process ID. Um, you can pretty much get the same information you get with PS. Um, and you can also actually get what network calls are out there. Um, so again, if they bring up Safari and go to Facebook, we can capture that. And there are actually apps on the App Store that let you do this. We're just providing, again, the raw code that lets you kind of hook in um, that into your own app if that's something you're worried about. If you don't want your users bring up Dropbox while they're using your enterprise app. Um, we also provide a little bit of whitelist and blacklist capabilities, just a way to say, look for the word Dropbox or look for the word Facebook in the process list or network list and then do something like phone home to your MDM solution or, you know, cut off access to whatever they're doing. So memory security, I touched on this a little earlier. Um, the idea is no matter how secure your data at rest is, at some point, um, the data that you're worried about is in memory and is decrypted. Um, 
So how can you limit that attack exposure? Uh, and so what this does is it provides you a way to wipe it, it provides you a way to check sum it, and kind of the idea with the little flowchart is you just track objects you care about and it's smart enough to go through, uh, figure out the references, change them all to C pointers, figure out how big the memory, memory regions are, kind of does all the hard work for you as much as it can. Um, and then at that point, you can check sum it to, if your word is getting changed, or you can wipe it whenever you're done with a key, um, whatever you really want to do. And kind of one weird caveat with this that we found that was interesting is the fact that whenever you use something like storyboards, they actually copy, they actually copy all the data and they don't pass by reference. So meaning once you've sent it over to the Apple libraries, you're kind of, kind of just game over um, with control over memory. So. And again, this protects from, from kind of an advanced attacker who has either got through um, something like security check and has attached a debugger or does like, uh, you know, can read the raw memory uh, physically um, or can dump the memory. So again, this, this is kind of that extra level of paranoia if you're worried. So file shredding, um, it's kind of the last one. So if you've been on Unix and Linux long enough, you're probably familiar with the shred command. Um, and this is really just providing it for iOS devices. If you're not familiar with the shred command, um, know that whenever you delete a file in Unix, Windows, pretty much any operating system, they mark the blocks of data as not, not in use anymore so that they can be overwritten at a later time. Um, so they're still there if, an, if someone can dump the device. And on iOS, if you like jailbreak the device, you can actually dump the raw character device and see things that have been deleted. Um, so what shred does, and same with our shred, um, is it goes through and it writes over each individual byte, usually with random data, usually multiple times. Um, and again, that way you're confident that the data is not recoverable by an attacker um, after you've deleted it. So. Again, same exact thing, works in your app sandbox. We've actually bundled it part of like Secure Foundation up there is kind of weird. It's just where we keep a repository of cool tools that we end up using a lot. Um, that, it does shred, file encryption, kind of all that sort of nice stuff we end up doing a lot when we're doing security, data, uh, security work. And then kind of finally, uh, a lot of our customers, when we go to them, it's like, okay, this is all great, um, but we don't, we don't want to build apps. We already bought apps, we already have them deployed through MDM solutions. Um, what can you actually do for us then? Um, so kind of the idea that we had was bundle up all these controls, put them together, fork them off in the background process, um, unbeknownst hopefully to the user, um, and then tie it in more or less to an MDM solution. Uh, kind of almost like a virus checker, but not a virus checker. It's just kind of monitoring the state of the threats and how the system is. So if like a jailbreak was detected or a debugger is detected, it can go back to the MDM solution and they can lock the device. Or if you're, or if you're very paranoid, um, you can hook up like an SSO solution um, and do that sort of thing. So again, just a way that you can actually leverage this stuff without actually having to um, recompile it into your apps. And with that, I will turn it back to Greg. Great, thanks very much, Gavin. Uh, okay, so now getting into app integrity um, and looking at the whole notion of um, binary at rest security. So just we kind of surveyed the research that's 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 been out there over the last 10 years or so, and um, there was um, a f these folks back in 2003 who did the who did this uh, tool called Shiva, where they actually um, changed the structure of binaries inside of the ELF format, uh, and then of course a year later there was a, um, a reverse engineer of that, um, and then folks in uh, Belgium, the University of uh, Louvain, they also had a really interesting paper on the whole idea of uh, protecting binaries. Um, so our focus for IMAS encrypted code modules, that's ECM, is on, you know, mobile dynamic libraries. That's what we're focused on. So the idea is that, um, so I, I go to, uh, I've been to many of these conferences and often um, in the audience and folks are talking about different ways that they statically uh, attack the apps. And so this, what we've explored is the idea of how do you really reduce that vulnerability. Um, so if you just look at a static attack, um, you know, the goals are privacy, reverse engineering, 
there's a bunch of free tools in the market to actually copy files and executables, particularly uh, this Wire Explorer can easily, uh, non-jailbroken devices can copy the whole executable over to your laptop and one can then start uh, uh, digging into it. Uh, you, know, you know, obviously the attacker uh, analyzes it, looks for vulnerabilities and then uh, tries to patch it and sidestep security. Just to put it, uh, put this through a few steps of the actual process, you know, IDA Pro is, is a tool that uh, attackers would use. It's fairly expensive, um, but once you have it, uh, even iOS apps can be ex uh, decompiled back to C code where you can really map out how the algorithms work and again try to sidestep that security. If you look online, there's several um, code injection and kind of binary patching uh, techniques out there. John Jartsky has a little a blog that talks about it. These guys at Applidium have a, a, a blog or a, a whole site that, that talks to that. Um, and, and, and it's just different, different techniques to basically get in there and nullify and exfiltrate data. Um, the folks at IBM uh, ArcSan have a great um, slide that talks about the consequence of a static attack and uh, it really goes through um, all the different uh, reasons of you know you know why static attacks are bad and uh, you know brand and trust damage reverse you know a revenue loss privacy unauthorized access and fraud um, so that's the whole idea around these cracked apps and there's there's uh, there's a cracked apps a cracked apps app store and copying apps and so it's, it's can be pretty damaging so we've come up with this research called uh, encrypted code modules and the idea is that um, we want to isolate sensitive algorithms inside of a dynamic library. Uh, and then at compile time, you encrypt those di that dynamic library uh, and bundle it in uh, with your application. Uh, now, this is not available. Um, uh, you deploy this. It's not available for the Apple App Store. You deploy it in your enterprise app store because fundamentally, uh, Apple does not allow dynamic libraries um, uh, to be bundled with apps that uh, are going into the App Store. Uh, so when you run the app, you would then decrypt the dynamic library on the fly, uh, and then you start to execute that code. Um, and so the notion is that if the attacker, um, if the attacker actually uh, got the app, um, there would be you know several chunks of code that would just be ciphertext that Ida Pro would know what to do with. So here, here's kind of that process uh, spelled out um, in graphical form. Starting on the left side, you know, a sensitive algorithm. Perhaps it's this notion of uh, app integrity. Um, and uh, so I have an app integrity checker that is a sensitive algorithm. And when it compiles, it, it compiles into a plain text dynamic library. We've created a tool called. Uh, CM Dynamic Library Builder, where you pass in your uh, plain text dynamic library, you pass in your, your key, uh, and it'll actually then encrypt the dynamic library, and which then gives you a ciphertext file that you would then, uh, then you bundle that in with your, uh, inside your app itself. Um, so just to talk about in more detail, um, if you look at the concept here, is we've used, we're using Xcode, uh, and so X, the, the, so Xcode uh, for iOS does not let you actually build dynamic libraries. So there's a, there's a few hacks on the web that you have to read and uh, change a couple of plists in Xcode to allow this to happen. Uh, and so anyways, uh, then you're able to actually build a dynamic library for iOS. Again, you pass it through this dynamic lab builder tool we have and you create the ciphertext. Um, once the ciphertext is, uh, or your dynamic library is bundled into Xcode, um, into the app itself, um, you see that it's locked. And so the idea is that on first install, um, the user would type in this, this special um, app ECM app key along with um, the passcode, the passcode for the app, so that that app key would be stored, encrypted on the on the device uh, with the app. And so uh, when so any time thereafter, when you when you log in, um, you would put in your app password, which then un, uh, unlocks the app key, which allows you to decrypt your dynamic library. Uh, and then you can you can basically have that critical functionality unlocked. So again, just to emphasize, at rest uh, is what the app would look like there, where the key is secure, um, the dynamic library is locked, and the attacker would just have uh, again chunks of ciphertext in there. So kind of jumping over to uh, app integrity is let's let's take this technology, this this thought, and take it to a, a level that's more useful, and that's um, well, let's validate not only let's pr let's protect my app at rest, but let's also validate that my app hasn't been patched. Um, and so um, you know that's the whole idea. You know, it's our, obviously you, I've just talked about, but static apps, uh, static attacks are very common. Um, 
you know, app integrity is the whole, is critical to kind of thwarting these techniques. And uh, implementing app integrity is really difficult. The, the cryptographic hash functions themselves um, can be used to verify apps. Essentially, they're a checksum. Um, and, you know, the security difficulties you deal with is, you know, the whole known good values of checksums can be tampered with. Um, reading the file, uh, that act can be tampered with. Um, you know, doing calculating the checksum, all the steps of a checksum can be tampered with. So. Um, here's kind of the details of our app integrity on iOS. So there's a lot on this slide. So let's start. Let's start with the little numbers. One, there's, there's three steps essentially. On the left side is um, is an Xcode project called ECM app Integrity Check. This is up on GitHub. And so one can um, that's where that's where the dynamic library sits. And in there is the actual app integrity checking mechanism, um, the algorithm. And then it has a place for the known good. Um, checksum itself and file size. So that, that gets compiled into this uh, dynamic library. And then you take that and you, you go into step uh, two is on the right you have your app itself um, that is ready to take on this uh, dynamic uh, app. And so I, with the app we have special build, uh, special build process inside of Xcode that calls out to this dynamic live builder, step three, and that's the part that bundles it, puts the key together, and actually uh, encrypts the dynamic library, and then bundles it with the app, re-signs the app so it, uh, it'll, it'll deploy properly. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a couple steps to it. It's three different Xcode projects. Um, the one in the middle you don't have to deal with. W when you're actually, when you have kind of your app, and, you know, kind of your sensitive algorithm set, you're really kind of iterating like any typical app development on, the, on this, on this, uh, this uh, project on the right, the demo app itself. So um, at this point, you have an app that now has um, its, its uh, checksum algorithm encrypted in there, its app integrity algorithm encrypted and uh, secure. Uh, and now at this point, the, if the attacker attempts to try to get at it, they really, it's, it's very difficult because it's just all ciphertext. So what we're doing here is we're forcing the attacker uh, away from the static uh, forensics and really push them more into that dynamic forensics, which is just a different skill set. It's, it's a harder job. Um, and part of what we're doing with security here is we're slowing the attacker, make, hopefully frustrating them, hopefully getting them to move on. But, um, so then once you, um, the app starts up, we unlock the app uh, and ultimately the dynamic library are the decoder, which essentially just decrypts it given that the app key is there. Uh, we read the file into memory uh, using DL open, which is you know standard Unix, Linux kind of libraries. Uh, we load the symbol, use a symbol table using DL sim. Uh, and then at that point, uh, we actually shred the file using the file shred technique that Gavin was talking about. Um, and, and then at that point, we can actually jump to that code and start executing. And when the uh, app integrity actually runs, we're going to read the app, the, um, the app file size itself. We'll also uh, calculate, we'll also open, you know, read the whole entire, fi entire file and calculate a SHA hash. And we're going to, and then compare that to the known good SHA hash and uh, file size that we calculated at build time. And that's where this big comparison happens. Um, so is the known good file, does it equal uh, the calculated file? And if it, and if it does, uh, you can programmatically continue. If it doesn't, you can programmatically decide to, um, you know, exit the app. Um, alert the user, degrade the functionality. The point is, is you have a programmatic check there that um, is secure enough to, uh, to trust about app integrity. All right, great. So we're just in time for a demo now. And um, <clears throat> I'll bring up, uh, we, we basically have a video to show. Um, and uh, let me just drag this over. Oh yeah, it's just not playing. Yeah, you want to start the app over? Yeah. You just come in and queue it. Let's try this again. So yeah, give us a moment here. We just when you think playing the, a video is the simplest thing to do. So if we maybe the full screen things coming up. Oh, that might be. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, we'll just yeah, just drag it over and pan left and right. 
it's just this small. Oh. There we go. Make sure I can pause. So yeah, really quick on the, um, gosh, you know my right foot and left by now. On the left hand side, um, we actually have the console for the raw device. Um, so it's just spitting out what the device is, is saying in the log files. And then on the right, we actually have our little demo app um, carrying on. Um, so it's entering a password. And this, this right now is the known, um, more or less good version of it. Um, so it's, they've logged in. Uh, we've just cleared the console real quick, and they're gonna perform this app integrity check. And it's probably very hard to read up there what the logger's saying, but what it's actually done, you see the big success, um, obviously it worked. And so what it's done, and this is kind of the happy path of this, is it's taken that encrypted dialib, uh, decrypted it using the nonce provided um, when they typed in their password, and then at that point, um, it's compare, it's ran that app integrity um, algorithm, that's our sensitive algorithm in this case, which has in it the checksum and the size of the binary, um, the demo binary that's actually calling it. Um, so over there, it's kind of hard to see, but you see two big matches where it's matched the size and the signature. Um, so again, that's the good case. The binary hasn't changed. Um, we gave it the right key, everyone's happy. It, it, we, we verified that this hasn't been statically messed with and that the user's authorized to kind of run it. So now we'll kind of hit the bad scenarios. Um, the first one's the simple bad scenario. Um, you'll actually see a, a text box pop up just for our own testing. Uh, we put where we could put the key however we wanted. Um, so in this case, we're gonna put in a just garbage key because that is not the actual key we use for the demo. Um, and then we go here, we see that it's failed. And so, yeah, big fail. And it's kind of a shorter uh, logging here because what it's done is it's tried to decrypt the um, dynamic library with the wrong key um, and then DL open that just garbage file. Um, and so whenever you try and DL open a garbage file, it's like, what, what is this? Um, so it kind of crashes out in the back. We catch that and then thus the giant fail. So that's the case where the user somehow tries to decrypt the library without the right key. And then the last um, scenario that'll come up here in a second is basically whenever, um, and this is the real one we kind of want to catch, is when the binary has been tampered with. So we've taken the exact same binary um, and we've patched it and patched in some extra code and we'll see when we run it. Um, again, we're kind of using our debug version here. So it's taking two passwords and our, our debug key was just key. This is actually the right key. So it's gonna go through it's gonna run. Um, we see another failure. Again, it's very hard to read the, the console log over there, but it's went through the decryption. Decryption's fine, did the DL open, the library's up and in memory. Call the app integrity, the app integrity um, secure algorithm, a sensitive algorithm runs, but at, um, at some point we see size mismatch and signature mismatch because the MD5 of the executable, that called the dilib is actually different. So we know that the app has actually been tampered with. And at that point, you can do whatever you want, bail out, phone home. Um, yeah, kind of, kind of just whatever your use case needs. So, yeah. So yeah, that's a little harder to do than like, because that's how you crack an app usually. You, you load up the app into memory um, and then find the offsets and then dump that region of memory and patch it back in. So this is a lot harder to do. Um, I didn't want to get into this, but it's, it's for, for one thing, we um, corrupt the header. So it's hard to get back the, um, the die lib out of the encrypted version because once it's loaded with the header, you don't need it anymore. Um, so that makes it a lot harder. And actually when you load it, if you hook it up with GDB, um, you don't actually see the offset. It just looks like an anonymous region of memory. So if you dumped all of the app memory and scrubbed over it um, and caught it just at this time, because what it does is it loads it, checks the checksum, checks the size, unloads it, wipes everything. So you'd have to really, really catch it just at the right time and have the password to get in. Uh, I, mean, I tried it myself just to like feel good about presenting this and, and I, I, was, I was stymied. There's a lot of, there's a lot of micro windows. There's a lot of micro windows. You're, a few micro windows. And the you, other thing is, is security check. Yeah, you yeah, if you, yeah, if you bundled it with another, yeah, we have like security check one that checks for GDB being hooked. So if you check then, it's, it's very difficult. So with that, I'll pass it back off to Greg. Yep. Thanks, Gavin. That's great. Yeah. So the other the idea is that um, is that is you run this 
this particular security control, like, like we did with encrypted core data, we bundle it with other IMAS security controls to really surround the app um, so that one, it makes it difficult to attach a debugger um, or even jailbreak and all that kind of stuff. So let me uh, finish up, we'll wrap it up with a few minutes left. So um, just kind of in closing, ECM and app integrity, the, key, the advantage of using the encrypted code module is really trying to protect against the static attacks. Um, we want to force the attacker over into the dynamic attack scenario, um, which is just a more advanced skill set, and it's uh, more difficult to do. Um, we're, you know, and the main thrust is we're really protecting against that app tampering. Um, and so with, with ECM in place, um, you know, one can protect sensitive algorithms, you can protect intellectual property, you can um, kind of check some, you can check some themselves, apps can check some themselves to ensure that they weren't patched. Um, and then we could, we, 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 you know, kind of our next step is we want to try to bring in one or two of our security controls, like maybe memory security can be uh, placed in a dynamic library and, uh, and then encrypted. And then, you know, then we got to thinking, well, down the road, why don't we try to put most of the app inside of the dynamic library? And so, uh, at st when, so when the app is at rest, really there's like a stub that just runs the app, uh, and which essentially de uh, decrypts the whole entire app. So we're continuing to uh, experiment with it. Um, ECM is up on GitHub. Um, it's been up there for about a month or so. Uh, all the code is there to experiment with. And just in closing, um, you know, we are obviously an OS project. We're up on the mobile tools uh, tab. Um, IMAS is listed there. Um, we've also teamed up with iGoat. Um, it's a collaborate collaboration effort just about a month or so ago, working with Ken Van Wick and Jonathan Carter. Um, and we're going to try to add um, IMAS security uh, controls to several of their exercises. Um, but basically, that's all we had. Um, uh, any, any other questions? Great. Thanks, 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 everyone, for your time. Really appreciate it.